So there's a um, Republican club in New York. The Democrats and the Republicans have like local organizations and they have it. The Republicans have an actual building um, and social club on the Upper East Side, the really rich right wing part of New York. Um, And they invited him to speak and he had spoken there before last year. The talk he actually was giving was a quote talk, uh, a reenactment of um, an assassination of a Japanese socialist uh, member of parliament in 1960 by a Japanese um, fascist. And so this is kind of ironic because if you remember last year, the right wing was going crazy that Shakespeare in the park was supposed to be some coded call by liberals to assassinate Trump and they came and disrupted Shakespeare, which truly shows the respect they have for Western civilization. Um, but this is a very explicit, you know, call, call to violence and advocacy of violence, um, frankly, if you ask me, since Gavin is always talking about, you know, encouraging his followers to violence. So uh, two local groups like, uh, you know, the pro-Stalinist Workers World Party or one of their front groups and some other um, activist group had called a demonstration. So not generally the proper, no Antifa group or, or, or um, anarchist group originally called it. I think an anarchist group endorsed it. The night before the talk, somebody smashed the club's windows out, glued the locks, and put a little communique out, uh, calling him a hipster fascist and denouncing you know, the Republicans and others. Um, so that day, maybe 100 people showed up for the protest that Gavin spoke. Um, and then afterwards, there were a bunch of Proud Boys there, probably 30 or 40, and and mixed in with them, people with both um, crossover membership and independent were members of two far-right skinhead gangs in New York, the 211 Boot Boys and B49. And some of the, at least one of them had gone to Charlottesville, and they've long been this uh, super violent you know, element in the New York scene. Um, they're not usually so political, but the, the Trump period has, I think, made them more political, and they do stuff with the Proud Boys sometimes, because one of the gangs is mostly Latino, and even though they're fairly neo-Nazi. Um, it's more difficult for them to hang out with boneheads than it is with Proud Boys who are you know, multiracial and accept members of people of color. So anyway, after the talk, apparently they all got together inside. There was a reporter inside. So they all got together like in a mob and started chanting and, and went outside. Unsurprisingly, fights broke out. Um, and then what was caught at the end of it was three people were walking away who it was claimed had stolen somebody's MAGA hat and 30 people come and beat them down on camera. Um, but also what happens is the NYT, NYPD, who are very, very aggressive policing force, um, walk up and kind of, I mean, after they sit and kick these people on the ground for a few minutes, the NYPD walk up and kind of, you know, shoo them away, and they don't arrest anybody, which is sort of wild. If you ever go to any kind of left-wing protest in New York, you know, sometimes you're, the cops are there like at a one-to-one figure. You know, there's 30 of you and 30 cops. They control everything. I mean, I've been in demonstrations where they literally couldn't shut the demonstration down, but they made you walk in a single file line with a police officer on each side. Um, and so they, they can control anything they want to and shut things down. And they clearly weren't even willing to make arrests. So what had happened is the Republic, the guy, the Republican Party head who ran that club had you know, call, before had called on the Democrats to denounce this terrible violence in his words against his club. It's like a broken window. I don't know who's hurt by this. Um, you know, and he had made a big deal out of it. So then what happened is the Democrats started, it becomes a political football that has very little to do with either the Proud Boys or left wing, you know, radical left people in town. Um, because then everyone from the state attorney general, the governor, the mayor, and other people called on um, the NYPD to go. Uh, to denounce the violence in the NYPD to make arrests. Um, three arrests happened that night, but they were all of uh, leftists, uh, apparently for uh, stealing somebody's bad. So um, there have been no more arrests. This became a big deal. All these you know, uh, politicians, local and state politicians, held press conferences. Um, I went to a couple of them. Um, you know, there were, you know, railing about stuff, but none of these politicians ever actually do work about the fact that there's far right um, groups in New York. Um, it was just is a political football against the, the Republicans. Um, no arrests have been made. Um, this is clearly a kind of strong point for the Proud Boys that they could mob up in New York City and beat people down and do it with impunity. Um, McGinnis claimed that he had you know lots of support inside the NYPD. Um, 
So that's kind of where we're at. And then the next day, I think there was another brawl, yet another brawl in Portland, Oregon, between, I think it was like a surprise march between some Proud Boys and then some counter-protesters. So a lot of the Proud Boys here probably shipped in from out of town. The ones that were identified, quite a number of them were like regional. Um, you know, Gavin's a millionaire. He can probably fund, you know, what happens a lot of these Proud Boy, Proud Boy events, people are coming in from around the country to them. The Republicans have, t- you know, they always kind of talk about Soros endlessly, like he's fun. But, you know, these are all uh, projections. In reality, they have a lot of money and they bust in supporters from out of town and they're the ones who aren't local and they're the ones who are, who are you know, violent and they're the ones who want a civil war. So every, basically everything they say about the left is really what they want and what they do. Um, a lot of these people are from out of town, but it's clearly like a point of pride for them. And then they have pretty much been treated with kid gloves. The If you're on the left, they've been really denounced. But I think even these articles like in the New York Times have really softballed this stuff. Like Gavin McGinnis had once been on a wrote for the white nationalist anti-immigrant publication V-Dare, and they simply called it a right-wing publication. So there's all this whitewashing of Gavin, what he believes, how racist he is, how Islamophobic he is, how misogynistic he is, how homophobic he is, and how anti-Semitic he is, they down, and how much he advocates really openly and loudly advocates violence. There's been a ton of downplaying of his actual politics and his actual um, you know, the practices he advocates by a lot of um, right wing and even center forces. So, I mean, the problem here is that it looks like there's a funny change where the open white nationalists look like they're being more moderate politically, like some of them, like an identity Europa, want to infiltrate the GOP or get, a, you know, work in a bottom up, um, get elected into positions from the bottom up in the in the Republican Party. Whereas Gavin McGinnis, so like the little bit more moderate than open white nationalists, because he allows in people of color and Jews and gay men into the gang, they're being more aggressive. So it's a kind of funny departure from the past. But um, it's a real it's a real moment right now, I think, for the alt light, like in the maybe last year, the alt right, the openly white nationalist alt right was had more power to um, flex its muscles in the streets. And now it tends to really shy away from this, and it's alt light people that tend to be far more aggressive in the streets. Uh, Probably and Patriot Prayer out west, who are led by Joey Gibson, who are similar but more attached to the militias and a little bit more wing nutty. (laughs) 